Hi there, I'm Craig and I'm here at Colonial Michelinacanaw in Mackinac City. And today I'd like to take a closer look at something that would have been very common here at Michelinacanaw back in the 18th century, uh, very common in a lot of different places in the world, and that's tea. Uh, it's something that's still very common. You probably enjoy a cup of tea at home uh, yourselves. Uh, but back in the 18th century, tea was a very important part of the British community here at Michelinacanaw, and it was also a very important part of British communities and British culture all over the world. And something that's pretty interesting and kind of cool when you start to think about it is that you can take a look at tea and there's a very simple face value uh, set of information about tea. But once you start to dig a little bit deeper, once you start to think about where it comes from, who was consuming it, what was the stuff that they needed to consume it, there's a whole new world of information that starts to open up to you. So let's take a deep dive into a simple cup of tea. So when we think about tea today, it's very stereotypically British, uh, so much so that it's an easy shorthand for British culture. And in fact, tea has been a major part of British culture for several hundred years. Uh, even back in the 1770s, which is the time period that we are reconstructing and interpreting here at Michelinacanaw today, tea was already a very important part of British culture. And in the 1770s, although many of the people who lived here at Michelinacanaw would have been French Canadian, there was also a very large Native American population here in Northern Michigan, there was a permanent British community here at Michelinacanaw as well. And in fact, this house that we're standing in right now has been set up to represent the home of a member of that British community, probably a British fur trader. And even in the 1770s, tea had been a part of British culture for over a century. Uh, it was actually introduced to British society back in the 1660s by a woman named Catherine of Braganza. Uh, she was a member of the Portuguese nobility. And in the early 1660s, she actually came to England to marry the king, Charles II. And being from Portugal, she was already aware of tea. The Portuguese had well-established trade routes all over the world. Uh, they had trade connections in China where the tea was being grown. So it was something that she was very familiar with. People in Britain were not familiar with tea. It was something new and exciting. And so when this new queen essentially arrived in Britain to take up the throne, she brought with her this new drink and it immediately became very fashionable. Uh, in part because it was so exotic and in part because the new queen was drinking it. Uh, there's actually kind of an apocryphal story about Catherine. Supposedly when she arrived in Britain, she asked for a refreshment. So she wanted something to drink and all that the British could offer her was beer, uh, another very stereotypical uh, English drink. Uh, and so she very quickly made sure that tea was imported to court. Uh, and in the 17th century, because tea was imported in relatively limited quantities, it was very expensive and it truly was uh, limited to the domain of the upper classes, the rich and the nobility, because they were the only ones who could afford it. But as time went on, that demand kept rising and more and more tea kept getting imported. There are whole companies set up specifically to import tea to Britain to feed this huge new demand. And so by really the middle of the 18th century, by the 1770s, the 1760s, tea was accessible really at all levels of British society, uh, from the, the highest levels of the high class down to really the lowest levels uh, of the working class everybody had access to tea, as well as a lot of the stuff that went along with tea, the, the, all the things that you needed to do to perform the tea ceremony. Now, again, that tea is available in Britain thanks to a global trading network. Again, I mentioned the Portuguese had already figured out uh, a lot of global trade back in the 17th century. By the middle of the 18th century, the British had as well. Uh, again, there are huge companies set up to import and export goods really all over the world. Tea itself is coming from China uh, in the 18th century. Uh, so there would have been British outposts in China. The Chinese government actually uh, placed some pretty tight restrictions on how uh, foreign traders would interact with uh, the Chinese population and with Chinese trade goods. Uh, but the basic idea was that the British and other European nations would ship manufactured goods to China uh, and they would use it to buy other things, uh, primarily tea, and that would then be shipped back uh, halfway around the world to Britain and other places in Europe. 
And it was imported again in such huge quantities that the price continued to drop so it was truly accessible uh, to all levels of society. Now, just like there were those British outposts in China that were there specifically to buy tea, to buy the natural resource that was available in that area, Michelin Mackinac existed to exploit the natural resources in this area of North America. Here, the natural resource was not tea, it was furs. Uh, and Europeans had been coming to this place here in the Great Lakes for uh, really about 150 years by the 1770s, interacting with the native people in this area because those Europeans really wanted furs. Uh, so this is a beaver fur. This is what would have been considered probably the most valuable fur to those uh, British and other European traders at that time. There was a huge demand for furs because they're used in the fashion industry. Maybe furs would have been used on cuffs or on collars, but the big thing that furs are used for in the 18th century is hats. A felt hat like this, uh, in some instances, would have been made out of fur, and beaver fur ends up making pretty nice felt hats. And so there was a huge demand for furs. And just like there were those outposts in China uh, acting as distribution centers for manufactured trade goods from Britain and elsewhere in Europe, Michelin Mackinac functions as a distribution center for trade goods here in the Upper Great Lakes. The natural resource that the British and other traders wanted here at Michelin Mackinac was furs, and in turn, they imported tons and tons of trade goods. That may have been muskets, it may have been pots and kettles, uh, it was uh, literally tons and tons of textiles. That was the most common trade item. And all of those things were essentially treated as cash. They were used to buy furs from the native people here in the Upper Great Lakes. It's the Native Americans who actually go out and trap the animals. The men are typically the ones who do the trapping. And then the women would clean the animals and prepare those pelts for sale. Uh, and they would sell those uh, furs in return for those European trade goods. And so just like those places in China where tea is coming in, trade goods are going out, Michelin Mackinac is one of those uh, essentially distribution centers for trade goods and also collection centers for whatever the local raw material is. And all of those raw materials, whether they be tea from China, sugar from the Caribbean, furs from here in North America, those are all sent back to the mother country, Britain or France or wherever else, turned into more manufactured goods, which are then shipped back out to those colonies, to those outposts, and used to purchase more raw materials. This is essentially how mercantile colonialism works. It's the whole idea behind having colonies in the 18th century. So to actually get started brewing a cup of tea, we first need to heat up some water. Uh, and so on the fire back there, I actually have a tea kettle, just a, a metal uh, tea kettle. Uh, on the fire with some water in it, getting it warmed up, getting it ready to boil. And again, that's going to take just a little while. Now, something that's important to keep in mind is that tea kettle and everything else that would have been needed to successfully uh, prepare and serve tea here at Michelin Mackinac would have been shipped out here. Again, Michelin Mackinac as a uh, distribution center for trade goods and as a collection point for furs, it sits astride a major trade route. Here at Michelin Mackinac, the trade route is out there in the Straits of Mackinac. Everything was moving by water and all sorts of uh, cargo would actually be passing through the Straits of Mackinac, mostly in canoes or bateaus, which are a large rowboat. But because Michelin Mackinac is already ideally located astride that trade route, that's one of the reasons why it's, it's in this place in the first place, the people who lived here could get essentially anything that they wanted. So the tea that came from China, some of the other pieces that came from other places in the world, they had access to all of that. It would just take a little while. And that's something else that's kind of interesting to remember is that although in the 18th century, Michelin Mackinac was pretty geographically isolated, and in some ways it still is today in the 21st century, uh, people could get what they wanted. They were part of a global economy. They are participants in a global system. It just moved at a little bit more of a slower pace uh, than what we are used to today. So for instance, if someone wanted to buy that tea kettle that we've got in the fire there, they wouldn't make it themselves here. They wouldn't go to the local blacksmith and ask them to, to make a tea kettle or anything like that. They would buy it. Uh, essentially, they could write to an agent uh, a purchasing agent, and that person might be in Detroit, they might be in Quebec, they might be in Albany, they might be in Montreal, they might be over in London. Uh, and the person wanting to buy that would request that item. That agent would then go out and purchase that item, ship it 
to the buyer, so ship it here to Michelin Mackinac, and then an account would just be charged. The buyer's account would be charged. There wasn't really a whole lot of actual money changing hands. Everything was done on credit. So it's actually very much like online shopping today. Uh, you go on a website, you pick out what you want, you click buy, uh, and I know at least for me, it automatically charges my credit card and I don't really have to think about it uh, beyond that. It's the same basic idea in the 18th century. It just takes a lot longer. They don't have two days shipping. Uh, it might take just a couple weeks in the summertime for things to get out here to Michel Mackinac. Uh, in the late fall, in the wintertime, in the early spring, it might be a few months before things get here. But uh, do remember that people are getting things here at Michel Mackinac from all over the world. The furs that they are shipping back out, they end up being distributed all over the world. So tea is just one example of, again, that, that global connectivity that existed in the 18th century. Now, uh, the tea itself, as I mentioned, would be coming from China. And there were different varieties of tea, uh, but those varieties were really just based on how the tea leaves were dried and how they were handled. Uh, and initially green tea was the most popular. Uh, a little bit later on in the early 18th century, black tea became more popular. Uh, but uh, again, there were no blends or anything like that. So there's not English breakfast uh, or Earl Grey or anything like that. Those are all 19th century inventions. The tea in the 18th century uh, really was just dried tea leaves and it just depended on how those leaves had been treated to determine the specific flavor. Now, I mentioned all of this stuff that you would need to properly prepare and serve tea. Uh, some of it probably seems pretty utilitarian, but in the 18th century, it was a point of pride to actually show that stuff off and have it displayed. So much so that in a lot of homes, there would be a tea table, a, a side table in some sort of public area. Uh, and all of the tea ware, all the things that you needed to prepare and serve tea would be more or less displayed on that table for anyone who entered that space. Uh, there may have been tea caddies, which are kind of like a little safe in which to actually store the leaf tea. They had tea trays uh, to easily carry that stuff around uh, and bring it to wherever it was being served. And then there are, again, a variety of other pieces that are linked to uh, how to actually prepare and serve the tea. So as I mentioned, the tea in the 18th century would have been just loose leaf tea. And again, by the 1770s, black tea is more popular than green tea. Green tea was still around, obviously, it's still around today, uh, but it had kind of fallen out of popular flavor in about the 1730s and black tea had taken its place. Now, again, the tea might be stored in a tea caddy. It might also be stored in just a tea tin. This one's quite plain, but these could be very, very elaborate. They might be metal, they might be ceramic. And again, the idea is to show all of this stuff off. And again, all of these elements, all of these pieces of the tea service would have been available at essentially all levels of society. Now, to actually get the tea ready to brew, I'm going to take the teapot, and the teapot represents a pretty interesting outgrowth of the popularity of tea because prior to the introduction of tea, there really wasn't a whole lot of use for a vessel uh, of this design. But as tea became more and more popular, uh, there actually is a whole industry that springs up in Britain specifically to produce items to go along with the increasing popularity of tea. And so by about the 1750s, you see an explosion in the ceramic industry uh, in Britain. Firms that are still around today, like Wedgwood, get their start producing items like teapots, like this, uh, for use in the tea ceremony. So there were domestically produced uh, tea wares. Uh, this one is actually probably an imported tea ware, uh, and it's a China teapot. It's called China because that's where it comes from. Just as tea was being shipped back to Britain from China, so too were other items. And China, this very specific type of uh, porcelain uh, uh, ware, is also being shipped back there. So this is very nice uh, import porcelain teapot. And to begin the process, all I'm going to do is take some of that tea and pour it directly into the teapot. I'm just going to take a capful here and dump that directly in there because what will eventually happen when I pour the water 
uh, into this teapot, it will steep the leaves, it will soak the leaves uh, and brew up the tea. Now I mentioned that Chinese import porcelain is very popular uh, in the 18th century. We actually find a lot of it here archeologically. Again, it just goes to show you how uh, wide those trade networks are spread in the 18th century. But again, there are domestically produced uh, tea wares coming out of Britain. Uh, and they're not only porcelain, there are uh, cream wares, so kind of a plainer uh, type of white ceramic. There are red wares. Uh, one of the nicest pieces actually in our archeological collection is a very small red ware teapot. It's actually on display in our Treasures from the Sand exhibit, our big underground archeological exhibit. There would have been uh, metal teapots and tea wares, so maybe pewter, maybe silver. And those different uh, materials were not really linked to any specific class. So a very wealthy person, a high class person might have a redware teapot. Uh, a very poor person might have uh, a pewter teapot that might look very fancy. And again, that just goes to show you that this stuff was truly available, again, at all levels of society. And again, we find pieces of these ceramic tea sets, both Chinese import porcelain, creamware, redware. We have found them here at Michelin Mackinac as part of our ongoing archeological program. Uh, and again, that just shows you how much uh, stuff is flowing in and out of Michelin Mackinac. Furs are obviously the big primary one. It's the reason that everybody's here in the first place, but because you need major trade routes here to ship those furs out and to get trade goods back in, it means that this community that uh, the British person, for instance, who lived in this house would have been very well connected with the rest of the world. Well, now that the water is boiling, I'm going to pull it off the fire and pour that water into the teapot here to actually let the tea begin to steep. And so while that tea is brewing up or steeping, we can actually talk a little bit more about some of the other elements that would have been present uh, in a standard tea set and what else they can tell us about British society. We've already you know, talked about how tea itself is a product of global trade uh, and even how uh, that growing popularity in tea really spurred the creation of a whole new industry in Britain, this whole new ceramics industry that kind of springs up in the middle of the 18th century, specifically to provide all of the stuff that people needed to prepare and serve tea. Now, I also mentioned that in about the 1730s, the 1740s, uh, people really switched, switched their preference from green tea to black tea. Black tea is a little bit more bitter. And so really in the 1740s is when you start to see people adding other things to their tea. And a standard part of any tea set is both a sugar bowl and a creamer. And cream, obviously, uh, is uh, made from milk. Uh, it's something that uh, could be produced a little bit more easily on a local basis. But sugar is very, very interesting. Sugar is another one of these commodities uh, that is uh, very much akin to furs, uh, like are being shipped through Michelin Mackinac, tea coming out of China. Uh, sugar is primarily coming out of the Caribbean at this point in time in the 18th century. And sugar is a massive, massive industry. Uh, the French and the British uh, had sugar islands in the Caribbean. Uh, and those islands had a relatively small white population, so they had a white minority population, and a much, much larger enslaved population, uh, almost made up entirely of people who had been enslaved in Africa, shipped across the Atlantic, uh, and were being forced to work on these sugar plantations, uh, really performing very dangerous, very back-breaking labor in addition to their condition as an enslaved person. Uh, and the sugar industry is uh, really quite horrible when you start to, to look at the way that those people were treated and what it takes to produce a little bit of sugar. But even in the 18th century, people had a massive sweet tooth. There was a massive demand for sugar and people were willing to overlook all of the terrible things that needed to take place to get sugar in Britain or in the Atlantic colonies here in North America or out here uh, at Michelin Mackinac because there was such a taste for sugar. And a big part of that is adding sugar to tea. And again, uh, it works in the exact same way. 
Those sugar islands provide a raw material that's shipped back to the mother country, uh, and the islands themselves serve as a market for manufactured goods. Now, uh, sugar ends up becoming kind of intertwined with a growing abolitionist movement, which by the 1770s, there was one uh, actually starting to spring up in Britain, people who uh, were coming to realize that the way that those enslaved African people on those plantations were treated uh, was just terrible. Uh, Josiah Wedgwood, again, the potter, is one of the, the leading members of this, this kind of new abolition movement, uh, but it would still be several more decades before slavery is actually abolished in the British Empire. It's actually not abolished until the 1830s. Uh, but again, people are starting to think about the implications of this global trade uh, and the implications of adding just a little spoonful of sugar to something like tea. But just like tea, sugar too was pervasive at all levels of of British society. Uh, it, so much of it was being produced, so much of it was being imported, that essentially everyone uh, could have it if they wanted it. Uh, there's actually uh, some social critiques that come out in the 18th century that note that even the poorest of the poor, so the people at the very bottom of the economic ladder, they might spend their last few uh, pence or uh, half pence uh, uh, on sugar or even treacle, which is a, a byproduct of the sugar making process, but it's sweet. Uh, they could have a little bit of sugar and a little bit of tea, and it's not much, but it helps them get through the day. It's just something very small, but it's, it's something nice that they can do for themselves. Uh, and again, there was kind of uh, some criticism that, well, why aren't the poor spending their money on you know, uh, other things? Why are they spending it on something frivolous like sugar? What those commentators really failed to overlook is that that sugar was essentially the only nice thing that a lot of those people could afford, uh, and it really did help them survive. It gave them a few more calories. It uh, allowed them to actually get through to the next day. Sugar also has a lot of pretty interesting political connotations uh, at this point in time in the 18th century. Remember I said that the British took control of Michilimackinac in 1761. They actually took control of this spot and the rest of what had been New France or French Canada beginning in 1760 as a result of the Seven Years' War. That's a global war that's fought in the late 1750s into the early 1760s, primarily between the French and the British, and it is truly a world war. Uh, it's fought not only in Europe, it's fought in the Caribbean, it's fought, fought here in North America, it's fought in Africa, in India, the South Pacific, uh, and long story short, the British eventually win. Uh, so they are able to acquire a lot of French territory, including Canada, so that's why Michilimackinac falls into British hands rather than remaining in French hands by the 1770s. And they do also take possession of a few of those Caribbean sugar islands, uh, in particular the island of Martinique. And so in 1763, when the French and British are trying to work out the terms of a peace treaty, the, P uh, the Treaty of Paris, that would formally end the war, uh, there was debate over whether or not some of these captured territories would get returned uh, to their original owners. Uh, and there was some thought that perhaps the British would retain Martinique, this brand new sugar island, uh, something that would uh, add to their sugar empire and perhaps give Canada back to the French. Uh, but there's actually a very powerful sugar lobby in Britain. They have uh, members of parliament who are essentially on their side, so they lobby those MPs uh, to support their sugar interests. Uh, and they were able to convince parliament and the British government to actually return Martinique to France and actually hold on to Canada. And that may seem counterintuitive at first. Why wouldn't the British want another sugar-producing colony? But think about those sugar producers, the people who were lobbying Parliament uh, to, to return Martinique, they didn't want the competition. They wanted to retain a monopoly on all sugar production in the British Empire, and they knew if this whole other island were added to the British possessions, they would have competition, prices might be forced down, and so they actually returned Martinique to France uh, and they uh, instead acquired Canada. Uh, it was perhaps no great loss to the French. Uh, Voltaire, the, the French philosopher, actually referred to Canada as a few acres of snow, uh, and uh, in some people's mind that's really all it was. But again, there is still a valuable natural resource here in the form of furs, but it is dwarfed in comparison uh, by the tea trade and especially the sugar trade that is taking place, again, worldwide uh, in the 18th century. And again, sugar, as an outgrowth of this uh, uh, demand for tea, really does have a role to play in international politics.
So now that the tea is pretty well steeped here inside the teapot, we can get ready to serve it. And serving and drinking the tea actually requires some specialized equipment as well. Uh, and so what people would be drinking tea out of in the 18th century is properly referred to as a tea bowl. Uh, it's not a tea cup or a mug, there's no handle on it, it's just a small bowl. And it really only holds an ounce or two of tea, so it's not like a big mug that we might be familiar with today. Uh, there's also a nice saucer that it can set on uh, because uh, you don't want drips or anything like that. Uh, but because this doesn't have a handle, and because this is a very delicate piece of porcelain, if you hold it up to the light, uh, it's actually vitrified, so you can kind of see through it. It's uh, kind of uh, opaque and uh, very thin. If you think about pouring a boiling hot liquid into this very thin-walled vessel, it's going to be very hot. So it's not something that you want to just grab with your entire hand uh, or, and put it into your palm, because you might burn yourself. And so if you think about the very stereotypical way of drinking tea in a, a fancy high-class situation, you might imagine someone, you know, very daintily grabbing it, pinky up, that sort of thing. That does have a kernel of truth buried into it because if you minimize the amount of skin that you have pressed against the walls of this tea bowl, the less like you are, likely you are to actually burn yourself. So this is not an affectation when you kind of spread your fingers out to drink tea out of a, a tea bowl like this. It's actually just how you have to drink the tea to keep yourself safe. Now, I'm actually going to uh, pour this tea into a more modern tea bowl here. I don't want to use that original uh, porcelain piece. So this one's a little bit bigger, but it works in the same way. It too does not have a handle. Uh, I will add just a little bit of sugar to it and also just a little bit of cream. Now, I can stir that together with another specialized piece of equipment which is a teaspoon, not just a unit of measure, it's an actual spoon designed specifically for use with tea. Uh, there's a, actually another type of spoon uh, that would have been used in the tea ceremony. It'd be a little bit bigger, it'd be a slotted spoon, uh, and it's called a moat spoon. Because remember, we're dealing with loose leaf tea in here. There's no tea bag or anything like that. And although this teapot does have a built-in strainer, it does have uh, some holes at the base of the spout there that will retain a lot of the tea leaves. Some do still flow into the tea bowl. And a moat spoon you could actually use to kind of dip in there and fish out those little floating bits of tea. And then there would typically also be a slot bowl on the table, uh, basically where you could discard those tea leaves. Uh, but with that, we can give the tea a try. And that's quite good. I do like sugar in my tea. I like it just a little bit uh, uh, sweeter than normal. But uh, again, all of that stuff is required to go into just that simple little uh, uh, bowl of tea that we've just made here. Now, there are even broader implications for this little bowl of tea when we start to look at the political aspect. Now, remember I mentioned that back in the 17th century, whole companies sprang up specifically to import tea. Uh, one of the biggest would actually become the British East India Company. Uh, and they are trading not only in India, they're also uh, trading elsewhere in Asia, and they are major importers of tea by the 18th century. Uh, and that huge demand for tea, as well as spices, as well as other things coming out of India and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, Asia, makes the East India Company immensely powerful uh, in the mid 18th century. Uh, they are truly a mega corporation. You can compare them to something like Amazon or Walmart today, these massive, massive corporations. But in fact, the East India Company had even more power than those mega corporations uh, because they also had their own army and their own navy, and they essentially ran the country of India as an extension of the company. So it'd be like if Google ran a country today and had its own army and navy and air force. We don't quite have anything like that still today, but in the 18th century, the East India Company was this massive commercial interest, again, supplying this huge demand for tea and all these other things coming out of places like China and India and elsewhere around the globe. They're importing all that stuff, shipping it back to Britain. Now, by the early 1770s, 
The East India Company, although it's this massive corporation, it was not doing well. Uh, they had actually become too successful. They had imported so much tea that uh, they actually couldn't sell it anymore. And there was so much demand for it that prices were very, very low. And so there were warehouses full of tea just piling up in Britain. Uh, and the East India Company was getting into a pretty rough financial situation. Uh, if you combine that with a financial panic that begins uh, in about 1772, 1773, there are banks that start collapsing in Britain. Uh, and so there's a financial panic. The East India Company really finds itself in a tough spot. Uh, and by about 1772, 73, they were on the verge of collapse. And if the company went, and by the way, people would just refer to it as the company. If you said the company or perhaps John company, you would know you were talking about the East India Company. That's how ubiquitous this corporation was. Uh, but the company was kind of teetering on the edge of collapse. Uh, and the government realized that the East India Company held such a major share of the British economy that if the company collapsed, they would pull down the entire British economy with it. Uh, they were so heavily invested in everything, their net worth was so high that if the company went under, there was a very real possibility that the British national economy would also be uh, destroyed as well. And so uh, Parliament uh, actually took steps uh, to try and prop up the East India Company. This is where you get the Tea Acts uh, in the early 1770s, which actually made tea easier to acquire here in the American colonies. Uh, they removed some of the import duties uh, on tea, so uh, they, uh, people in the American colonies and here in Canada did not necessarily have to pay a tax on tea uh, to have it imported anymore. Uh, and the whole idea was that it would be easier to sell tea out in the colonies, try to get rid of that huge surplus and try to generate some revenue uh, for the East India Company. But we're also talking about a time period where people, especially in the Atlantic colonies, especially in New England, were really starting to resent British rule. And they didn't like the fact that these various laws, like the Tea Act, uh, were being passed more or less without their consent. And so as a form of protest, People actually started boycotting uh, British tea, uh, or you also have instances like the Boston Tea Party where some of the tea ships carrying this tea across the Atlantic to Boston specifically intended to kind of bolster the sales for the East India Company and by the same token prop up the British economy uh, were very unpopular and that tea gets destroyed. And there are actually tea parties in other places, not just in Boston, uh, but again, that's all part of this effort to try and save this massive component of the British national economy. Uh, today, we're, we know the British uh, uh, did not respond well to the Boston Tea Party uh, and a few other things. They respond with more acts of parliament specifically designed uh, to punish uh, the American colonies and punish Massachusetts specifically. So for instance, in 1774, as a result of the Boston Tea Party, they uh, pass a number of what they called coercive acts, things like the Boston Port Act, which specifically closes the port of Boston, so nothing can come in or out. And those are all designed to punish uh, people in Massachusetts for participating in these tea boycotts and these tea parties. And of course, we are probably aware that those events feed directly into the American Revolution. So you can kind of look at the revolution itself and the formation of the United States as an outgrowth of this desire for tea and all the implications that come with it. Now, one more thing that's kind of interesting to remember about everything that I've just done, uh, preparing the tea, serving the tea, if there were guests here, I would be sharing it with them. Uh, in the 18th century, that would all very much have been gendered labor and men would not have been doing it. It was very much within the woman's sphere of work within the home. And that actually ended up giving women a considerable amount of power and both men and women realized that. Now, in the 18th century, there is a growing culture of hospitality in Britain. They're kind of looking over to the continent, to Europe, seeing what's going on in places like France. Uh, and it's becoming more and more fashionable to be a good host or hostess when people come to visit. And that usually meant serving them in some way, uh, acting as kind of a servant, uh, regardless of who came to visit your home. And tea is ideally suited to play into that increased 
uh, sense of responsibility to be a good host because although it does take a little while, although it takes a lot of equipment, it's actually relatively easy to make. All you need to do is boil some water. It's relatively quick. Uh, you can contrast it to, for instance, trying to prepare a whole meal. That might take hours uh, and people have to be seated. You need all sorts of other equipment for that. Tea is something that's relatively quick and easy that you can serve to prove that you are a good host or hostess. It's something that's socially acceptable to serve to people at all different levels of the social spectrum. So it could easily be served to a workman uh, coming to the home to do some repairs. It could be served to friends, uh, basically social equals, and it could be served to people higher up on the social ladder. And again, because women are doing that, they have a lot of control over that environment and they have a lot of control over the level of hospitality that they are sharing with their guests. And again, both men and women realized that power. Uh, if a woman decided that she didn't like someone who was visiting, she could pointedly snub them in certain ways. She could refuse to serve tea. She could be a poor hostess by choice. And that could have some very serious implications for her husband or the man of the house. Maybe the person calling was uh, a business partner. Maybe they were a superior at work. Uh, and the way that the woman chose to interact with people during the tea ceremony uh, could really impact other relationships. And again, both men and women were fully aware of that. There were some men who actually were, were not entirely happy about the amount of social power that women wielded while serving tea. They talked about the tyranny of the tea table, but it's some place where women are able to claim some agency and have um, a little bit more say, not only in their own lives, but in the lives of others around them. Tea is also, uh, again, something that it's socially acceptable for women of all social classes to actually make. Uh, because, for instance, if there were a high-class woman, uh, a wealthy woman, she could perhaps have a servant boiling the water so she wouldn't need to actually get close to the fire and potentially get dirty. That servant could then come in, leave the tea kettle with the boiling water in it, and then withdraw. And the woman of the house could then do everything else on her own. So again, tea even takes on um, some gender dimensions by this point in time in the 18th century as well, in addition to the political and the economic uh, and the diplomatic roles that we've been talking about. So that's just a quick look at the roles, roles plural, that tea played in British society. And we would have seen that played out kind of on a smaller scale here at Michelin Mackinac. Michelin Mackinac is a microcosm of British society in the 18th century. We know that people were getting tea out here. Uh, for instance, we know that John Askin, one of the merchants here uh, in the 1770s, he actually complained when all he could get was green tea at one point. He also complained to his agents that the tea that was being sent up here uh, had been in transit for so long that it had basically turned into a powder uh, and really wasn't easy to, to brew or drink. And so people are getting this stuff out here. Again, we find archaeological evidence of many pieces of the tea service, and we know that people would have been drinking it here. And we also know that just by taking a closer look at that tea, we can reveal all different aspects of culture. So I challenge you to do that at home. If you pick something at your house or in your life uh, that may seem pretty mundane, pretty utilitarian, start to think about it a little bit more. Where did it come from? How did it get to you? How did it end up in your hands? Who made it? What thought processes went into making it? What sort of political factors, what sort of social factors went into making it? Because you can do that type of investigation with really anything. We've just chosen tea here because it was so popular amongst uh, the British population, not only here at Michelin Mackinac, but worldwide. Now that is just a quick look at tea here at Michelin Mackinac. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. Hopefully you've had a chance to perhaps brew some tea at home and enjoy uh, a cup yourself. And uh, we do hope that you'll be able to join us here at Michelin Mackinac sometime soon.